we're going to start. Welcome everyone. It's, it's nice to see colleagues from UWC and also from our neighboring institutions. Very nice to, to have you all. And of course it's a huge pleasure to welcome Nicolinos Zembilas back to UWC. He has spoken here a couple of times over the last couple of years, so he knows the place. Um, for those of you who don't know Nicolinos, he is a professor of educational theory and curriculum studies at the Open University of Cyprus. He's also a visiting professor and research fellow at the Institute of Reconciliation and Social Justice at the University of the Free State and at the Center for Critical Studies in Higher Education Transformation at Nelson Mandela University. And I'm sure most of you know that he's written extensively on emotion and affect in relation to social justice pedagogies and also on intercultural and peace education, human rights education and citizenship education. And many of you have used his work on the pedagogy of discomfort. So it will be nice to hear him in flesh if those of you who haven't yet been to his talks here. His latest book is entitled Peace Education in a Conflict Troubled Society, um, published by Cambridge. And he also received the Distinguished Researcher Award in Social Sciences and Humanities for 2016 from the Cyprus Research Prom Promotion Foundation. So welcome and we're very much looking forward to what you have to say about decolonization, mm -hmm. a topic that's close to many of our hearts <coughs> and that we've been thinking about here. And I think you're going to be talking about, for about 35 minutes or so, and then we'll have questions and comments from the floor. Thanks for taking us over Thank to you. you. I'm delighted to be here to see so many familiar faces. I'm deeply grateful to Viv for making this uh, happening, and for the invitation and for arranging everything. You will excuse me, I have slides, so I need to, I need to sit and, and talk. But saying that, um, let's not wait for all the questions until the end. Please uh, feel free to interrupt me at any point. Um, there, there's going to be plenty of time in the end for, for a discussion, but if there is any need for immediate clarification of something I will say, just raise your hand and you know, ask your question. I, I mean, I would love this to be more interactive than me just lecturing here. So, what is the point of departure of my talk today? You, you, you're very familiar that there is a new interest in decolonizing higher education, especially after Rhodes must fall and fees must fall uh, movements in, in South Africa. <coughs> Globally, though, there, there has been a discussion about the colonial term. These are some of the terms that have been, that have been used. The colonial term, the colonial thinking, the colonial gaze for some time. Now, the colonial thinking is not something new. It has existed since the very beginning, the very inception of modern forms of, of colonization, that is late 15th and early 16th centuries. However, the more massive and possibly more profound shift towards what some are uh, called decoloniality took place in uh, recent decades and is still unfolding right now in the middle as we are talking. So the fundamental questions I'm, I'm going to try to uh, address today, although I'm not going to obviously provide answers to, to all of them because each one of them is a whole you know, debate, are the following. What does decolonization entail? Why the need to decolonize? What are the challenges of decolonization? What are the limits placed on the decolonization project by the forces of neoliberalism? Is decolonization the same as Africanization? Is decolonization the same as transformation? I mean, in this country, there is a lot of talk about transformation. Are they the same things? How does decolonization of curriculum and pedagogy take place? What does decolonization in higher education look like? 
And are there any tensions, complexities, or paradoxes emerging in the colonization efforts in higher education? Now, so I'm going to start by providing a, a short discussion on uh, some theoretical ideas on, on the colonization, especially through uh, the ideas of some of the colonial thinkers, just to get a glimpse of the theoretical framework of my talk. Then I will address limits and risks of, of the colonial thinking, because I don't want to idealize this as just as much as we, I, I think it's dangerous to idealize uh, even the, the most noble ideas. Um, decolonization and Africanization, decolonization and transformation, I will try to distinguish those projects, what are the converge convergences and, and divergences. And then I will uh, specifically focus on decolonizing higher education, the different approaches, especially in relation to uh, curriculum and pedagogy, and I will end with my five kind of lessons <coughs> on fundamental shifts for decolonization in higher education based on my theoretical work as well as my ongoing work in, uh, in South Africa at the University of Free State, here uh, at UWC, and uh, most uh, recently at the uh, Nelson Mandela University and, and transformation in higher education. So decolonization is a concept that takes on different meanings uh, across different contexts. However, I want to highlight two important ideas um, that I think I want to carry through my presentation to the end. Uh, the first one is that decolonization resists Eurocentrism and acknowledges the contribution of colonized populations across the globe. And the second idea is that it emphasizes a moral imperative. There is an ethical dimension to the decolonization project. So it's not only political or epistemological, but I clearly emphasize the ethical dimension of, of decolonization as well. For righting the wrongs of colonial domination, so it's an ethical stance in relation to social justice for those peoples enslaved and disempowered by persistent forms of, of coloniality. In other words, it is the interrogation of how Eurocentric thought, knowledge and power structures are implicated in the marginalization, exploitation and exclusion of colonized peoples and groups and it aims at the end of the day, at reimagining modernity. Modernity, as I will emphasize, is very much entangled with, uh, with colonialism and coloniality. So it aims at reimagining modernity as a project of violent, epistemic, and territorial expansion to clear its past and point towards different futures. Now, as I will say later, there are various approaches some people talk about completely dismantling. Other people, other theorists talk about, you know, reimagining and reframing the project of humanism and modernity. So I will try to touch a little bit on this different approach to see their nuances and then how the different options are led in, in terms of higher education because this, this ultimately is my concern. Um, now, a few names of the colonial thinkers, uh, Enrique Dussel, Anibal Tijano, Escobar, Mignolo, Boaventura de Sousa Santos, why uh, he, he talked recently here, right? No, it was Boaventura de Sousa. Hmm? Uh, it was another one, it was Ben um, Mario. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Sylvia Winter and Maria Lucones. Now, I'm not going to give like a, a detailed kind of um, uh, description or discussion on these different theories, but I want you to take uh, a glimpse of some of their fundamental ideas because I'm going to use those terminologies and I want to uh, be clear in terms of the terminologies and the vocabularies that we use. So from Kihano, 
um, a, a, a basic concept that he has developed is the notion of coloniality of power. Um, a global hegemonic model of power and place that articulated race, labor, space, and peoples according to the needs of capital and to the benefit of white Europeans. So there is very much here an entanglement between uh, power, uh, modernity, and capitalism for exploitation. So coloniality, he says, is a system that defines the organization and dissemination of epistemic, material, and social resources in ways that reproduce modernity's imperial project. And he identifies three dimensions of coloniality. There is speciality, that is the control of lands, races, the elimination and subjugation of difference, and third, the geopolitics of knowledge production, that is the epistemic violence against uh, anything that is not uh, Western, European, Eurocentric uh, knowledge. He makes, I think, a, a valuable distinction between colonialism and coloniality. So colonialism, he says, is a temporal period of oppression that has come and gone. It's a historical period. However, coloniality is something that is still with us today because it's the underlying logic that places peoples and knowledge into a classification system such that all that is European is valorized. Now, I realize that some people may not like this, this distinction of this terminology and they would like, for example, to use uh, the sustained term of co colonialism. I, I don't want to stick on, you know, um, arguing for the one or the other. I just find this distinction valuable in terms of, of talking about coloniality as a sustained project rather than going to the historical period of, of colonialism, although some would uh, uh, arguably uh, say there is colonialism still going on today. Now, Mignolo, um, an Argentinian uh, thinker, um, talked about the colonial matrix of power and knowledge that does not serve all humanity but a small portion of it that benefits from the belief that in terms of epistemology there is only one game in town and that game is Western epistemology. So coloniality and modernity, we see again this idea they are very much entangled. They go together. Modernity provides a rhetoric of salvation, and the examples that are often used is you know, conversion to Christianity, civilizing missions to the indigenous uh, population so that they can become uh, Christian, or contemporary uh, discourses of development. So there is this notion of um, uh, coloniality going with uh, contemporary discourses of, of, of uh, providing the resources for development. So the notion of development, he argues, is not innocent, mm -hmm. but is very much embedded within the discourse of uh, coloniality and the project of modernity. And one of his most known terms is the colonial thinking which aims at engaging in what he calls epistemic disobedience in order to envision social life, knowledge, and institutions differently. It's, it's, it's becoming disobedient to the Western project of epistemology and knowledge production. So unless we become disobedient to that kind of project, which instills epistemic violence violence into us, there is no way we can engage in, 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 in the colonial, in the decolonial project. So there is this decolonial thinking which is not only thinking, it's much more than thinking, it's the term thinking, but it's the practices, it's the everyday practices that need to change the practices of knowledge production that need to change, the institutions, as I will talk about later with the example of higher education that we need to adapt a different way of thinking 
Now, by the two of the Sousa Santos uh, Portuguese um, theorists uh, talked about the notion of epistemologies of the South. Now, you see the threat that is coming from all these decolonial thinkers, uh, that the unique, there are unique epistemologies that have emerged from the South, and these epistemologies have been marginalized um, and, and rejected by the, uh, the only game in town. So um, he highlights in this manner that the South is not just a geographical, but rather an epistemic and political map. And this is a, a very important idea. So it's not about the geography, the South collectively, but the South is, is, uh, is an epistemic and a political uh, place. And as we'll see later from Sylvia Winter, a, a, a similar idea of the different genres that come out from a different geographical place. So it's, it's not simply a geographical place. It's much more than that. So it's a source. This place, this market, is a unique, is a source of unique knowledge emerging out of the experience of various forms of oppression. Unique experiences of oppression. So it's not simply geography, it's more than that. So epistemologies of the South have been consistently delegitimized, a process that he calls epistemicide, namely the murder of knowledge. So the knowledge of the South has been systematically murdered by Western epistemologies, which became the only game in town. Um, an interesting concept that I, I, I use lately from uh, Boaventura and de Sousa Santos is the notion of cognitive justice, the recognition of epistemic diversity, and his notion that there is no way we can talk about global social justice as a separate thought project from global cognitive justice. So, Social justice and cognitive justice, that is the recognition of epistemic diversity, are very much entangled. You cannot have one, you cannot talk about social justice without uh, cognitive justice. Maria Lugones, um, another uh, Argentinian uh, thinker, uh, emphasizes more, um, focuses more on gender the coloniality of gender, the analysis, and she does the analysis of racialized, capitalist, and gender oppression. And she makes, I think, a, a very a valuable distinction, some find it a bit provocative, between liberal feminism, which is very much embedded in Western epistemology, and the colonial feminism. So she suggests that feminists need to expand and become more decolonial. Liberal feminism is not enough to address the complexities and multiplicities of, uh, of um, oppression, social injustices in the world. So there is need to recognize indigenous social structures and their relation to the land. And these constitute opposition and consciousness to colonial systems of sexual, ecological, and spatial hierarchies. And the last, I believe, theorist that I will talk about is Sylvia Winter from Jamaica, uh, who argues that colonization practices are entangled with the long history of Western imperialism and capitalism, and thus are reflected in knowledge production processes and institutions, including the university. So she puts forward a notion of humanness. She makes a distinction between human beings and the man with a capital M. And she says that being human signals not a noun but a verb. Being human is a praxis of humanness <coughs> as opposed to an individual autonomous entity that is embedded in the Western uh, epistemology. Every knowledge is embodied and situated as raised and gendered in marginalized and colonized settings. 
That's why she talks about genre specific modes of being human. There are different genres in being human. Unfortunately, the only genre that uh, is the game in town that has become prevalent is the man with a capital M, the Western ideal uh, model of uh, individual autonomous uh, entity. The trajectories of Western genres of human linked with colonialism as economic, cultural, and historic technologies of power produced these distinctions, these dichotomies between human, subhuman, have, have not, rational, irrational. However, what, is, what I find interesting in her project is that she doesn't want to abolish humanism. There is a lot of talk, as we know, about post-humanism or abandoning completely the project of humanism. She says, no, we shouldn't, we shouldn't do that. It's, it's too early to abandon, the, uh, to abolish humanism completely. We have to reinvent it. We have to reframe it in different terms so that the consequences of colonialism are acknowledged and dismantled and the knowledge production par paradigm is reconceptualized. So we shouldn't abandon humanism because it has been hijacked by Western epistemology. We have to reinvent it. Now, to summarize this kind of very weak uh, trip into some decolonial thinkers. Uh, the first idea, Eurocentric knowledge has to be deconstructed and reconstructed to acknowledge the contributions of colonized populations across the globe. Second, colonialism, modernity, <coughs> capitalism are very much entangled. Third, social justice is inseparable from cognitive justice. Four, coloniality still continues to deny the colonized and historically marginalized spaces to legitimate their own epistemic frames, its implications in academia need to be critically evaluated. And finally, decolonization is not an event, it's rather an ongoing process, and it is not easy to achieve, and I will come back to, the, to this several times towards the end. So can you just say a little bit more about cognitive justice? Cognitive justice is acknowledging, for example, indigenous, indigenous knowledge. And, and, the, um, and so there is a connection because unless you recognize all these alternative um, epistemic ways, or the diverse ways of knowing the world, there, there is no way you can have social justice. So it's very much they go together. Now, I don't want to avoid the issue of risks. Everything we do includes some kind of risk. So I want to acknowledge two here. The first one, that the colonial thinking runs the risk of essentializing complex knowledge formation, formations, rendering a false dichotomy or moral evaluation between the so-called good African versus bad Western knowledge. I think it would be too simplistic to end up saying one is good, the other is bad, get rid of the one, let's move on. It's not as simple as that. The second one, it is more important to take, I think, African experience and theory seriously rather than claiming a uniquely African experience. <coughs> I think setting a boundary that this is uniquely, whatever that means, if you can isolate it and put it in a box and say this is, this is completely African and it has, not, um, uh, it has not been influenced by any other uh, knowledge systems, I think it, it, it would be very simplistic again and very essentializing at the same time. There are complex entanglements between knowledge formations. Now, Saying so, I do want to make a distinction, at least acknowledge the complexity in debates between decolonization and Africanization. They are not the same thing. 
and the colonization is different from Africanization, however there have been different takes on it. If you take Fanon for example, the cause for Africanization, he's, he believes that they are haunted by the dark desire to get rid of the foreigner, of the foreigner and there is an element of inverted racism in them. This is his opinion. Now, a different notion of Africanization by Nguki is to Africanize is part of a larger politics of language, the use of mother tongue in Africa, and the colonization is not an end point, but rather an ongoing struggle of what we should be teaching ourselves and our children in Africa. So the call for Africanization is a project of decentering European knowledge and recentering knowledge. Similarly, there is a lot of debate between um, decolonization and transformation. Are they the same thing? Now, there are different, is, is one the subset of the other? Um, we have the one view that says transformation is much broader and complicated process than decolonization because transformation includes many, many things. This is the view of Jonathan Janssen. There are failing public schools, healthcare system, corruption as well. So to radically change society is a task that goes beyond decolonization. There is another view that says decolonization is at the heart of transformation. There cannot be transformation without decolonization. Again, we could have like debates for hours and hours whether one is the subset of the other. And the question is, is this a valuable conversation? If we can agree on some, uh, on what the end, what what end, what is the vision of this of this process that we may call, some of us may call transformation, and some of us may call decolonization at the same time. I don't want to just erase their possible uh, differences. For me, it's an open question whether one is the subset of the other and whether strategically it has to be so. So, um, in higher education now, to move on to our uh, uh, focus of, of today's talk, there are different approaches, and, and I outline here three by no means, they are not the only ones, and they are not mutually exclusive either. So, one of them is transforming, disrupting the institutional cultures as they now exist, privileging neoliberal structures, so at the level of the institution. The second one is exposing the dominance of Eurocentrism at the levels of curriculum and pedagogy. And the third one is transforming, disrupting this dominance by pointing to knowledge possibilities that have been denied uh, relevance, and this goes across different levels, um, uh, across different levels. I will try to give an example of what I mean with, it, with each uh, approach and talk about a little bit um, to, to give you an idea what, what, what I mean. So, we have at the level of the institution, the colonizing university structures, and here I'm using Achille Bembe's uh, uh, recent uh, article on decolonizing the university and his suggestion that it implies a range of transformations a range of different things that need to happen simultaneously. So it's not either you change the curriculum or you change pedagogy. You might do that, but at the institutional level, something else is happening and uh, it derails the whole effort. So there are many things that need to change at the same time, maybe not at the same pace. Then, then we talk about strategy. But, but definitely, it's many things that need to change. And he mentions, for example, democratizing the system of access and management, reversing the systems of authoritative control, standardization, classification, 
commodification, accountancy, and bureaucratization reflected in the organizational structures, teaching methods, and assessment mechanisms of students and faculty alike. And I give you two very um, characteristic quotes. To decolonize, he says, implies breaking the cycle that tends to turn students into customers and consumers. The neoliberal kind of vocabulary that is very much uh, trendy, uh, not only in this country, uh, in many countries. To decolonize the university, another quote, is to reform it with the aim of creating a more open, critical, cosmopolitan, pluriversalism. A task that involves the radical refounding of our ways of thinking and a transcendence of our disciplinary divisions. So just one example, the, the way that our disciplines, and if you look at historically how our different disciplines emerged, they're very much a modernity, colonial project, how the sciences have been developed. He argues that unless we think outside these boxes that we put ourselves, and we consider ourselves experts within an area, a uh, specific area, then um, we are not decolonizing. Now we can talk about this later, to what degree this is possible, pragmatically speaking, or uh, whether there are any repercussions or any negative consequences. Um, Decolonizing pedagogy, I'm using one of the first definitions here to talk about specifically about pedagogy. Uh, from 2003, uh, in an edited collection, decolonizing pedagogy must be guided by a conceptually dynamic worldview and a set of values that make it anti capitalist, anti racist, anti sexist, and anti homophobic. So there is there is um, a convergence in the different projects, in the different social justice projects. And many times, one of the legacies of Western way of thinking is to compartmentalize and say, well, I'm, I'm doing anti-racist work. Or I'm doing, you know, I'm working on environmental sustainability. Or I'm working um, uh, in uh, anti uh, sexism, I mean gender studies and so on. These projects are very much related. So if we want a pedagogy that is decolonizing, we have to join forces. It is informed by a theoretical heteroglossia. There has been a lot of work developed in different areas um, that strategically utilizes theorizations and understandings from various fields and conceptual frameworks to unmask the logics. This is the ultimate goal that everybody is joined uh, together to unmask the logics, workings, and effects of colonial domination, oppression, exploitation in our contemporary context. There, there are some different manifestations. We have to unmask the logic and reimagine this in a different way. And, and pretty much all of these uh, different theoretical or practical uh, fields or areas, however you want to name them, they, they are joined uh, by this same similar vision. It draws, decolonizing pedagogy draws from various theoretical frameworks, post-colonial studies, critical pedagogy, critical race theory, uh, critical whiteness studies, black feminist theory, so that educators and students are offered spaces and tools to recontextualize knowledge from non eurocentric perspectives. It recognizes and takes an active stance against the multiple ways in which knowledge production in the neoliberal order is implicated in the material conditions of coloniality, and it provides uh, educators and students the analytical and methodological tools for debating, challenging, and deconstructing inherited canons. So decolonizing the university means different things that can happen either 
uh, individually or, or together. Liberate curriculum thinking from Cartesian binaries, such as including Ubuntu philosophy, interconnections with the human and the non-human, and so on. Redesign curricula to include local epistemologies, indigenous and other knowledges. Rethink radically Western disciplines and their contents, for example, to include knowing through the pain, anger, and other experiences of colonial expansion and decolonization. Three uh, strategies that have been suggested by Subedi in an article on education and theory in 2003 that I find very useful and, and I try to incorporate in my teaching uh, in courses as well is anti-essentialism. It critiques the monolithic portrayal of knowledge while emphasizing the value of recognizing not only the link between Western epistemology and modernity and coloniality, but also the contributions made by the South. What she calls contributing readings, it focuses explicitly on questions of colonization and imperialism and ethical solidarity. solidarity. I'm rushing a bit because I want to leave time for discussion and I'm coming <coughs> towards the end. Um, here is a table that outlines the different desired uh, changes. And there are different courses we can take. From the most naive, you might say one, everything is awesome, nothing needs to change, no recognition of decolonization as a desirable project, no decolonization practices required, towards you know, the last one, which is beyond reform, dismantling systematic violences. And I think the point of this table, which I borrowed from uh, Vanessa Andreotti's uh, article in 2015 with, with some changes, is there are different choices. There are different choices we can make strategically and institutionally in terms of what form of decolonization we want or we want to commit ourselves in higher education. Because some might argue, well, maybe we should start with a soft reform. Look at the second one, soft reform. No recognition of decolonization is a desirable project, but inclusion of some other epistemologies. And it might be argued that soft reform might be the starting point so that you don't you know, make, uh, make radical changes so that people don't react, you know, um, in unpleasant ways. <laughs> so it, it depends what, what is your vision of decolonization. There are different options. So it's very important to clarify the assumptions that come within the vision that you cannot have you know, radical reform when you don't even recognize that there is coloniality still going on at different levels. It's, it, it, it's, it's very naive to wish to have decolonization but not be willing to take measures to even recognize uh, that there is coloniality at several levels. Some of them visible, many of them invisible. Open-ended questions by um, Andreotti. What would an approach to education look like that takes seriously the pedagogical task of addressing the foreclosures that hide how modernity's shadow is produced in order to subsidize its shine as students both face the depths of this violence and participate in its reproduction, how can we ethically address their effective responses? What would an academic writing, for example, look like that acknowledges but goes beyond or does not rely solely on modern representation, its supremacy of universal reason and the dear social categories that we are so committed to? So, to sum up, five fundamental shifts 
for the decolonization of higher education. Um, if you haven't heard anything so far, it's fine. Just, just listen to these five slides and, and you're, you're going to be fine. First, awareness of decolonization is not enough. Its consequences must be exposed and challenged. Second, reject the discourse of deficiency, very widespread in, in, in universities. And dominant thinking in higher education in South Africa attempts to understand student difficulty by framing students and their families as lacking academic and cultural resources. Three, acknowledge the socio-political context and its challenges and develop a strategic stepped approach to challenge colonized practices and, and structures. Some might disagree with me and say, no, we need radical steps. We can discuss this. Uh, at least from my immediate experience in similar changes, uh, uh, similar changes of transformation, I mean, in terms of the bigger project of transformation in Cyprus, because I don't want to speak of, of South Africa on behalf of you. Four, good intentions are not enough. You cannot be neutral. Neutrality amounts to perpetuating the status quo. And the last one, my favorite, accept a loss of likability. You will make enemies, but you have to live with this. And I leave you with two quotes. I'm not going to read them. One from Franz Fanon. And the other from Enrique. Thank you very much for your attention. They don't comments. have to be questions. Yeah, they comments. Can be comments, and uh, we can have a conversation. Or, or Do you want to take them one at a time, or a um, couple at a time? Yeah, one at a time. I think. Yeah. Vanessa, um, as you as we think about the student protest, um, please must fall and those must those must fall. How have you thought about it in this framework? Because I know people like Jonathan Jansen have suggested that students' calls for decolonization wouldn't really, didn't really have anything to do with decolonization. It was just a handy kind of term to throw all their disaffection into. So how, how I mean, we had statues being broken down. We had uh, students being confronted and military. We had all, all kinds of elements in the student protest and within all of this, there was a call for decolonization. What, what's your analysis of what is it that students were actually thinking, demanding, understanding? I have And I think it would be a bit dangerous or naive on my part to claim that I, I, I don't know a lot of people, but I don't think you can know and draw the boundaries and say, well, this, is, this has nothing to do with the decolonization, decolonization project at all. I mean, if you look at the historical, the political, the social context that those protests, protests emerged, I think you can, you can argue that there, there must be some relevance to it. But I, I, that's not really the most important concern. The most important concern, let's be focused on decolonization. Do we agree that there has to be a project of decolonization at various levels? If we agree, then let's talk about the vision of decolonization, let's talk about what options we have, and let's have a, a, a strategic approach how to uh, engage with this. There, there will be different opinions, interpretations, some people may feel offended, 
some may people want to, they may have, uh, you know, different interpretations of what's going on. I think it's part of the game. There is no transformation without pain and suffering. Uh, if you are committed to, you know, uh, decolonization without an empty content, uh, I repeat this, it has to be, you know, it has to be debated, it has to be, we have to be, at least most of us, on the same side when we talk about we need to take bold measures of decolonizing the uh, curriculum or the pedagogies that we use. Not everybody will go along. Some people will be made unhappy. That's part of the game. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, can you say something more about rejecting the sources of efficiency? About what? Uh, rejecting the sources of efficiency. Because it's one thing to just say reject. It's I find that the sources of deficit. It's such a um, intransigent thing, and it morphs. So and it has different manifestations exactly, exactly. in the curriculum, in exactly, the teaching, exactly. in the yeah. If you talk about pedagogy, I think um, what I'm doing today is exactly the opposite, like lecturing, which is a traditional way of kind of telling you my knowledge, um, this is not a pedagogical way of engaging uh, because it has, it comes with several assumptions that are very problematic. So going into a higher education classroom and simply lecturing uh, is not enough. Um, for this to happen, there are many things that need to change. It's not only a, a matter of a pedagogy. It's a matter of curriculum, it's a matter of, of the department culture, the university culture, the institutions, and so on. So it's not enough for one uh, uh, you know, lecturer to use more critically engaged, collaborative projects, methods, where people are engaged in communal learning, and so on. Those are not sustained if they don't come together with at least the majority of, of the department. So there is very much entrenched this assumption that certain populations come into the classroom with um, less cultural or other forms of capital. And it's not something new that it's only true for South Africa. I mean, the, the notion of cultural capital and deficit thinking um, uh, is very much embedded in many, many societies, uh, not only at the level of, of, of the pedagogy, but at the wider societal and, and cultural level. So if I had to bet on this, it would be one of the most serious challenges you have, we have, to change because it's so much embedded in ways that we are not always conscious of it, that to dismantle this would require dramatic changes on, on many levels. No, and, and I think that's why yeah. there's just no movement or it moves into something else. So when you get people to understand that students are bringing something to the classroom, they then start talking about it to effectively. Effectively was that it's not, they don't have the right kind of motivation. So just when you get them to accept that cognitively they're okay to be there, it then morphs to something else. And you have this continuous sort of reframing and entrenchment of these, these narratives and discourses of the of deficit. Yeah, and they're so powerful that it's they so come powerful. in different, in different uh, manifestations that are not always visible. Absolutely. That's the most, m most, most of the times, the, the most powerful manifestations are the invisible ones. Absolutely. Yes, I think you and then. Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. I still, I still struggle to understand this discussion about the colonialism and colonization and neoliberalism. Especially 
if you think about ranking of higher education institutions, a bundling higher education provision becomes a market. It's about like airline ticket, whether you're going to buy low cost or <laughs> full fee or like a commercial airline. So in all of that that is happening, I have an impression sometimes that there are like two discussions that are happening and I'm not really sure, I still don't see the connection. How do we merge these two discussions together? So can help with that. So how do we talk about this project in the light of unbundling of higher education and this? Well, uh, I think the, the examples that uh, Ashley Ben Ben in his articles are very characteristic. Let me go back to them because he gives several examples that show the the entanglement with for example, take the system of assessment of uh, professors. You know, how professors, I don't know in your university how you are assessed, but in some universities, you know, there are specific, you know, uh, guidelines that you have to spend so many hours at the office. You have to publish so many articles. You have to uh, teach so many hours and so many classes. And usually it becomes more and more. And there is never, there, there, there is rarely a discussion about the repercussions to the students. Because if you are better continuously with all these responsibilities, because and you have more and more students because the university needs to make money and profit in some cases when there are profitable you know, uh, entities. Then, I mean, there is, there is a question of you know, where are we going? Um, is it something that is productive at the end of the day? So, is there, just ask, so who, who, who is supposed to ask this question? Who has the power? To ask That's a very good question. Questions. I think including us who are working and talking about us because we are working at the university, we are students and, and, and faculty. Um, first of all, we have to ask those questions. Well, I'm a false doctor. I also have come on the, on the last, last, last in the, the food chain. So. Well, I mean, the, hierarchy, the, the institutional hierarchy of our universities precisely prevent postdocs and other students from having a voice and faculty many times mm -hmm. to have a voice and raise their voice and be here. So you see how they are very much entangled. So unless you change those institutional structures for more, to make them more democratic, democratizing the access, your voice, there is a set of consequences that um, are in line and, and, and make those two things that you mentioned uh, very much linked. Um, a good point to make, and, and I hope my thoughts are okay here because I'm just excited. Anyway, um, talking about the discourse and deficit, right? I think it's really dangerous to move away from it and reject the discourse of deficit because it's sort of, um, it's a move to innocence on the part of the institution, you know, and it invisibilizes students. What I think we need to do is reconceptualize deficit and relocate it. Instead of locating deficit within the students, we have to think about locating deficit in the academics in the institution and the deficit in, in institutional management and the institution itself. Because um, you, you speak of, of a, a decolonial pedagogy uh, being anti-racist, anti-sexist, and anti-homophobic, um, and anti-all of the different isms you get, right? Um, but if, if these institutions were originally set up by man, I still don't think it's a man, you know, the Western man. Um, how, does, how, does, how is that man able to recognize 
what is homophobic behavior to be anti-homophobic. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not if you're not a colonial subject who experiences the violence, you won't understand how the violence materializes. You won't understand um, the different places where the violence happens and occurs, or how it manifests, right? And you won't understand that ethic that goes along with that. So how, how do you work with that if you don't recognize the deficit in yourself to not understand that? And to start from a point of, of listening and becoming the humble teacher, you know, of, of really listening, because I've been hearing the, the, the discord of deficit about students. But what about deficit in academics? Not understanding what racism is, and not understanding the experience of black students. Um, what it means when, when the university puts up a, a military tent to write exams and have dogs on campuses, and, and not understanding the history of black people with dogs, and the history of black people with, with police. So it's, it's one thing to say, um, yeah, we have to have Moving beyond good intentions, right? Uh, moving beyond good intentions and realizing that, that me as a teacher, I have a deficit because I have so many blind spots due to my, the way that my identity has been constructed under colonial rule, right? I first have to move away and decolonize or, or, or relocate my own identity before I can start engaging with the identity of my students and be prepared to relocate their identities as well within my classroom. So it's about that shift of, of understanding deficit as important, as important word to hold. Because if we if we have to acknowledge decolonization as a project, we have to realize that there, there's a deficit that we have to overcome. Right? Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Us not being deco decolonized is a deficit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm to say. It was a lot in the dinner for us. No, this is a very good point. Uh, my only concern is I don't want to um, repeat the discourse of vocabulary of deficit mm -hmm. because if you shift it somewhere else, everything else I agree with what you said. And very good points. Mm -hmm. And it starts definitely, and this is one of the most challenging and traumatic for some people to acknowledge our own uh, complicity to, uh, to coloniality. And it's not an easy thing to do, and everybody is a victim of this. Either we recognize it or not. So what you said is very much right in point, and, and you're right. I, I wouldn't use the word complete. I would use the word uh, uh, deficit. But so what would you? Use? Um, I would. I would say complicit. I would say. I would not say asset. Yeah. <laughs> I would say asset. You know, an asset model, asset view towards communities and towards our students and even towards ourselves, even when ourselves, we know ourselves we're not able to totally deliver on this decolonialization whatever. You know? I mean that's why I came to this talk in the first place. Like good intentions are not enough, but they're a good start. But it's definitely not enough. So but um one of the things that I liked in the talk the most was this distinction between colonialism and coloniality. And I thought, wow, this must also apply to neo-colonialism and neo-coloniality. So I like these, these examples that are up here. What are some examples, and maybe do you know a university in Africa or not that's managed to, <laughs> you know, but the minus already? No. Yeah. Uh, already that managed to do all well, that. No. That's moving in the right direction towards really combating the, the neo coloniality yeah. that is the most difficult to combat because neo coloniality is coming and saying, yeah, we are decolonizing, but at the same time, we're keeping them down. Mm -hmm. That is the, I find that the most frustrating thing about living in this planet. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, you know, you had these different levels up there. You had the university and you had um, pedagogy and you had curriculum, but it's part of the problem, I think, that you are identifying. I don't think you can locate it in those levels only. Mm -hmm. It's an international higher education and policy level as well. So if we're looking at the individual or the university, it's, it's really not going to work because it's part 
of the system. And, you know, take academia and how it works. I mean, it's, it's working in a particular way because of international neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't think that in, as individual institutions we can actually, um, you know, separate these things off. And I think people have to collaborate across southern contexts and, and also southern and northern mm -hmm. and, you know, take things on in a, in a bigger way rather than just located in one institution. Even in South Africa, we are so differently placed in terms of our institutions that it wouldn't work to just look inward. Okay. Well, I think Viv is making a very good point. That's why many people may feel paralyzed or uh, that everything that we do at the end of the day, what's going to be the outcome when, when you think I mean, the university is just a branch of coloniality. So are you, that's why we're talking about transformation of the whole society. And it's not going to come from the university. The university will make its contribution. And, and I mean, we, met, we better make our contribution in, in, in terms of, of this project. But I don't think, I don't have the illusion that we at the university level will you know, decolonize the society. Um, it has to happen with collaborations from various sectors and not only within, because this is an international project, it's not only within a country, either it's named South Africa or Cyprus or whatever, but, but it's all over the world mm -hmm. and it's in different manifestations. Uh, um, ecology and, and sustainability is also another you know, manifestation of oppression uh, and, and, the, and coloniality. So, and these projects are very much connected. Yes? Just elaborate a bit on the whole issue of language. We're speaking about decolonization in English. Very difficult, very difficult. Uh, and what it means for higher education? Yeah. Very difficult. Um, so, I mean, there is, and you, you, you are aware that, you know, of the debates at the University of Free State with the adoption of, uh, of English and so on. Um, there are, I'm, I'm ambivalent about it because, on the one hand, I, th I definitely think mother tongue is very important, and there is a lot of research at least at the uh, levels of primary and secondary education, which are more familiar when it comes to this issue of language, that there are successful models of adapting you know, mother tongue and another language so people become bilingual or trilingual depending on the context. So it's a very sensitive political issue, the issue of language. On the other hand, we cannot ignore that English is the language of coloniality, of colonialism. So there, is, there are some people who feel very adamantly against, against the adoption of English. And I don't, I don't really have a solution for that. I don't, I'm not sure what's the right, because then I would come up with a generalization that it wouldn't fit your context here, uh, but it might fit another context. Yeah, right. uh, thanks very much uh, for your talk, Michaelidis. It really frames the whole area really well. You know, my question is, um, to what extent is the enterprise, this whole enterprise and frenzy around decolonization, part of its undoing? To what extent then, I'm asking, is it being captured by being incorporated into the mainstream um, so that it, my sense is, almost becomes not a critical engagement with a, a way in which to reimagine um, uh, a ways of being, but when it becomes incorporated in such a, and often in very technicist ways, um, I find it hugely problematic. So I'd like you perhaps to comment on that. No, no, I think that you make a very good point on that, that there is always this 
danger of adapting the vocabulary at a very superficial, naive way as a strategy of you know, comforting the concerns of some people who want to move into that direction, but deep down the structures, and I think, I mean, we can see that in, in, various, in various universities, um, when you adapt, you know, these procedures that seemingly come from the debates on, on decolonization or hearing students' concerns, but at the end of the day, the institutional structures remain unchanged. And um, I think it, it's, it's part of being vigilant to be able to recognize, like you do right now, and point out you know, in various venues, publicly or in your settings, that this is going on and, and, and try to address this issue. I, I don't have a specific example, but um, I think the point that you make is very valid and there's always this risk and this danger uh, with many things as a political strategy as well by people who are not, are not for that project and, and they're trying to find ways of uh, subverting it. I think that um, we're going to have to end off now, but we'll be around. There is lunch outside, and I'm sure people can engage further with Michelinos. But I just wanted to say thank you so much for a very clear and comprehensive outline and uh, sort of traveling into this field. And uh, this is just a small token of our appreciation. Yeah. There's lunch outside, so feel free to stay a while, and thanks for staying on. <laughs>